Um, so as Paul says, my name is Janet, and I'm from San Francisco. And I've worked at, as he said, three startups. One went public, all good. One was acquired by eBay, again, all good. And one crashed and burned hard, not so good. So if I flinch, it's probably the scars left over from that third one. But I've been living in the Netherlands for the past two years, helping really large companies innovate like a startup. And these large companies, they come to me and they say, hey, we want to be like a startup. And a startup is like a speedboat. They're fast, they're nimble, they're doing agile, they're doing lean, they turn on a dime, they're fantastic. And the challenge is, I say a big company is actually more like a container ship. And container ships are awesome too. When I lived in San Francisco, one of my favorite things to do was to go out right by Golden Gate Bridge and you can watch the container ships coming in from China. Uh, and these things are massive and they move at scale and they're efficient, right? That's awesome. And so when people try to mix these two worlds together, the challenge is oftentimes we end up getting this which doesn't take the best of both worlds and combine them, right? What we want to have is something more like this, where the container ship and the speedboat can work together so we get our benefits of both worlds. And so when I started working with these big companies, what I did, my first instinct was, well, let's just do what we did with the startups, right? And I would like cut, paste, and put there in the startup, right? What we did in the big, or put in the big company what we did in the startup, right? Uh, and that didn't work so well. <laughs> that was another crash and burn. So uh, of two years of iterating on this, we've come up with a model that, uh, Cleverly, we think we named the circle, circle, square model. <laughs> and here it is. So in the center, we have a circle that's the innovators. And these are the people that are doing agile and lean startup and trying to launch a product. Uh, and on the top, we have executives. And they're the ones who are saying, you know, go innovate. We've got to disrupt our competitors. We've got to cut costs. We've got to grow. And they're setting the vision for the company. And then around the innovators, we have what I'm going to call the internal ecosystem. And these are people like HR, finance, legal, procurement, sales, marketing. And the innovator is kind of embedded in this world. Uh, and that's how we came up with Circle, Circle, Square, which I know like Steve Jobs is probably rolling over in his grave at a name like that. But um, <laughs> I thought I would dive in and talk about each one of these blocks individually. So I'll start with the executives. And in my view, the role of an executive is to set the vision and create the environment for innovation. And let's take a look at each one of these. So we start with setting the vision. And I think that's three things. One, they think about alignment within the company. They have to think about the portfolio. And they have to think about how disruptive they want to be. So for strategic alignment, we have to have all the bo boats oars rowing in the same direction. So I once worked with a company that ran an innovation challenge. And it was, you know, 200 ideas that came forward from across the company. And they had three rounds of judges. And they finally came and they picked five ideas that they were going to move forward with. And one of the ideas was to help banking, to help small entrepreneurs in Africa. Right? And that was a feel-good idea. Everybody loved it. And the team came and worked with us. Right? They're really great. They pivoted. They iterated. They did lean startup. And then they went off on their journey back in the company. And I checked in with them a year later, and I'm like, so how's it going? And they're like, oh, well, we all quit. And the reason is, the vast majority of the company was focused on Europe. In fact, they didn't even directly do business in Africa. It was through partners they did business in Africa. And so there was no senior executive to say, yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb, and we're going to do this project. And so it stalled out, because it had no alignment with where the organization wants to go. So when you pick your innovation projects, it's got to be aligned. Next, we talk about portfolio management. Because the reality is, we don't want just one speedboat as a big company. We want this. We want multiple speedboats, lots of bets going on by the company. And does anybody know this gentleman here? This is Dave McClure. And he's part of what we call the PayPal Mafia. So PayPal has spawned in Silicon Valley a lot of great entrepreneurs, right? Elon Musk comes from PayPal. Peter Thiel, the founder of LinkedIn, also comes from there. Yammer, YouTube, a lot of entrepreneurs. And David comes from there as well. And he started 500 Startups, which is an accelerator there. Uh, and he's also known for being really 
edgy. So if you ever can see one of his talks, it's entertaining. And one of his talks that he did is he calls it, I got 99 problems, but a batch ain't one of them. And what he's talking about here is if you look from an investor's point of view, you know, you're going to have a portfolio here and some are not going to do well and some are going to do really good. And then he went and he got, well, some of Silicon Valley's best investors, what's the probability of getting this? Like, you don't get a unicorn very often. And this is only if you're a good investor, right? And so, you know, you get your ROI, right? 50% of zero is zero, right? 25% of a half is 13, 12 and a half, but we're going to round, right? So if I get my portfolio and I say I'm going to invest in 15 companies, we're actually less than one over here. I can't make a three quarters of an investment in a company, so I got to go zero. And that means my ROI is actually negative. I've got to get my batch size up to at least 30 before I start to get something interesting happening. So as a company, you want to sit there and make a lot of bets. And here's how companies think about it. We call it three horizons. Uh, the first horizon, this is for our core business. This is what's generating our cash flow. Horizon two, this is for our rapidly growing or adjacent businesses. These are things that's a little bit further out. They're providing revenue, but we're not really quite you know, cash flow yet. And Horizon 3 is emerging businesses, way far out there, right? And so we want to have our bets across all three of them, but not probably equally spaced, right? So if you look at Google, here's how Google does it, 70, 20, 10. Intuit is more 60, 30, 10. Intuit's a software company, a big adopter of lean startup. Uh, so you've got to figure out where you're going to be. The third thing a company has to figure out is how disruptive they want to be. Now. Disruption is great. We all know it, right? You come out with a smaller, kind of less good product that comes and everyone kind of laughs at it at first, but then it starts to get momentum and ends up crushing you because it's a lower cost product base. And it's one thing to disrupt another company. Try disrupting your own company, right? Try going into a VP and having this conversation and saying, uh, hi, I, I know you're in charge of this product that's making a lot of money for the company, but I'm going to come out with a product that's going to deliver a tenth of the profit and put you out of business. Right? Like, awkward conversation. <laughs> so a company has to decide, are we going to do this or not? Are we going to try to disrupt ourselves or not? And if they do, they need senior executive support. Uh, one product I worked on was with Philips. This is called the One Blade. Uh, it's kind of a little bit disruptive in that it's, uh, it's an electric shaver. It's an electric blade. I can't speak personally to this, but men tell me this is very exciting. It can take off a full beard, dry shave, one pass. But it's not as good as an old school shaver, because an old school shaver gives you that baby bottom smooth. Uh, this is a, it's smooth, but not baby bottom. So, uh, so it's also, it goes for $19.99, right? And a shaver is like 100 bucks, right? So this is a disruptive product. But here's the thing, a shaver, people, it's for people over 35, right? It's your grandfather has a shaver. They managed to figure out how to position this for the 18 to 35 year old market. Not only that, it was targeted with a value proposition that was to attract the 18, 35 year olds and repel the 35 plus, right? So now it's additive. It's no longer disruptive. And you don't have to have that conversation with the VP of shaving to be like, hey, I'm going to put you out of business, right? So you have to think about how much do you want to be disruptive. And if you want to be disruptive, you have to have senior level support behind you. So the executive set the vision by saying alignment, or my portfolio, and am I going to be disruptive or not? They also create the environment. And you know, people say I want my teams to be more entrepreneurial. And I tell managers, if you want your teams to be more entrepreneurial, it's on you. You have to create an environment where it's safe for them to fail, where they're pushed, where they make decisions based on data. Uh, so for example, you also have to provide protection. When I was there working um, at Philips, like I'm trying, I'm breaking all the rules here. I'm trying to do everything like different. And you know, it normally takes three months to put something up on the corporate website. And so I go there and I talk to them and they're like, all right, for you, six weeks. And I'm like, can I have it by Wednesday? <laughs> and you know, it's one thing to break all the rules. If you're like, well, I'm backed by a $50 million product, right? I've got revenue behind me. I'm, I'm running the whole business, right? Then you could break rules. I'm saying I've got $0 revenue behind me, and I want to break the rules, right? That is not a tenable situation unless someone high up 
is running coverage and saying, no, 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 we're doing this. So they need to do that. Um, they also need to provide a roadmap. I think sometimes companies get surprised when these entrepreneurial efforts like actually get traction. I had one company that took, uh, once it started to get traction, six months to decide whether or not the team could move forward on it. And during that six months, a competitor came out with the exact product for their exact uh, target audience. Another team took nine months, and during that time, the entire team quit in frustration. So you need to give the teams roadmaps, like what happens? What's the success criteria? How do you move forward? You also have to be willing to invest uh, for a return, invest for a long time before you get a return. So do you know how long, on average, it takes for a corporate venture to hit profitability? Any guesses? Nope. Seven years, close, seven. And how many years does it take, or how many had a positive cash flow in the first two years? This is based off a study of corporate ventures. Zero. And uh, the first year revenue projections were off by 80% on average, and the first year profitability projections are off by 116%. So I might suggest we might need some innovation accounting and stop making projections, but that's a different talk. <laughs> So, back to the circle, circle, square model, that's what the executives need to focus on. Let's move over to the innovators. Now, we've heard a lot of talks today. These are the people doing lean startup and agile. So I'm not going to go into, you know, the best way to do that. I think you've gotten a lot of good talks on that. I'm going to talk about here what I think the role of a team is. First, they have to decide how they will achieve the goals. They execute, here's our lean startup and agile, and they prevent, present evidence to management. And why I want the teams to decide how they'll achieve the goal is that we all know our first idea is not always a good idea, right? And the teams are closest to the customer, so they can do the iteration. We don't want to have the hippo, highest paid person's opinion, making calling the shots. We got to get it out to the teams. And the teams need to be small and dedicated. So when I started on the Phillips Project One, this was our team. Uh, and by the time we finished, this was our team. We had to kick people off. We had a lot of people be like, I, I want to be on the team, but I'm just going to show up for the weekly meeting. That's it, right? No, off. Small, focused, dedicated, functional team on it. Uh, and I jo so we have uh, Jeff Bezos has a rule. Uh, you if you can't feed a team with two pizzas, it's too large. And when I say that, I'm not talking about an American-style pizza. <laughs> All right? So it's got to be a two-pizza team. But even if you get a team, a lot of teams fail. In fact, CB Insights did a study of failed startup teams, and 23% of them attributed their failure to the wrong team. So the question is, what makes the winning team that you're going to put on this innovation initiative? And I would say it comes down to three things. You need a skill set, mindset, and tool set on your team. I'll start with a mindset. For me, a mindset's simple. 80% ownership, right? And you know the people in your company that have this, the people you can give something to and they just run with it and take it, right? And those that you have to hold their hand. So we want ownership as 80% of it, and 20% of it is a never give up attitude, right? We're breaking rules. We're backed by zero dollar revenue. We're trying to do things differently. You've got to hang in there. So in a sense, what I'm looking for is the corporate misfits. I often joke, if you're like scouting for people to put on an innovation project, go to HR and ask for the person with the fattest file and take that person, right? You have people in your organizations who are not going to play the political game and are willing to go down to the mat and fight, right? And they're still there, so you just have to find them. As far as skill set, I always believe you need to have what we call a hacker, a hustler, and a hipster. Someone who's going to hack things together, a programmer, the hustler is a business person, and the hipster is our UX designer. I want a cross-functional team. I've actually updated this, because uh, I think we also need what I'm going to call a handler, a project manager. I think you need to have a balance in teams between people who have big ideas and people who want to get stuff done. Uh, the idea versus the execution. I'm actually working with a bunch of teams now they came out through an innovation process where the company was like, hey, do you have a good idea? Come forward with your idea. Give me your ideas. And so I've got these teams that are all idea focused. And uh, OK, I'll teach you a Dutch word. Um, it is luchtfeester. Did I say that right? You're Dutch. There we go. That's how you say it. Uh, it means air biker. And it's these people who will sit up here all the time, pedaling really hard, thinking, talking, talking, talking. And you have to pull them down to the ground before you get some traction. 
So you need to have a balance. You need to have someone who's executing. So imagine you'll get different people step forward if you say, hey, uh, give me your good ideas. Or hey, do you want to come build a business? Different type of people will step forward. On the same note, if you talk about like, hey, I'm looking for a bold risk taker and you know someone who's going to be push the envelope, you're probably going to get more men applying. If you talk about like, hey, do you want to work collaboratively in a team to solve problems, you'll get more women stepping forward. So think about how you talk about your innovation efforts. It also helps to have a seniority on the team. I'm working with two teams now. One super junior, right? They're great, but we work in uh, sprints, so two-week sprints, and at the end of the two weeks, we have a retrospective, and we say that's a great time to bring in your key stakeholders, the VPs, the people who are gonna be making a decision on it. And now I'm doing a 13-week innovation program. We're up to week 10, and for the first time, they managed to get a stakeholder there. They're not senior enough to navigate the organization. I compare it with another team I'm working with, where every team member has been in that company for at least 15 years. One of them is personal friends of the CEO because they came up through the organization together. On their stakeholder reviews or stakeholder um, demos, the CEO is a stakeholder. He shows up to every single one. And let me tell you, if you got the CEO showing up, you got every other stakeholder showing up. So you need to have people senior enough to navigate the organization. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is the internal ecosystem. Again, that's HR, finance, procurement, legal, all these people, right? And oftentimes, there's a big difference in cultures between the innovators and this ecosystem. So for example, uh, an innovator would be fine, being like, my first eight ideas failed. No problem, I'm on to the ninth. And a big company, whew, that's not acceptable. An innovator will be like, hey, can I have some money? And they go to finance, who's gonna be like, yeah, what's your five-year pro forma? And they're like, I made it up, I don't know. Right, that doesn't work in a big company. An innovator's gonna be like, I came up with a totally brand new product. Legal's there, whoa, we might get sued. What's the precedence on this, right? An innovator's like, we wanna use some external vendors. I wanna put Hotjar on my Squarespace page and run a Facebook ad campaign, right? Procurement's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Are those approved, right? You know, an innovator is like going to a business manager, like, hey, I've got a rad new product. Do you want to sponsor it? And they're like, whoa, is that on my, I got a five-year plan. Like, where are you in my plan? I'm oh, sorry, the plan's set, right? An innovator might be like, hey, I've talked to customer X. Sales will be like, what you, who gave you permission to talk to that person, right? I don't know, has anybody run into any of these problems in big companies? Yeah, right? And you know what? I don't want to be harsh on the, the ecosystem, right? They're awesome. They're doing their job. It's just there's a cultural difference going on here. And when I first started, what I did, I was like, fine, we're running a non-branded, unbranded experiment. Psh, whatever, we're doing it. Uh, and, you know, a couple weeks later, Lego got, call, like, got wind of it and called me into their office, right? And that's never good because now I'm behind the eight ball. They think they're busting me for doing something wrong. Uh, and, you know, I'm having, so I'm trying to explain to legal what we're doing. And so I'm there, I'm like, well, we're running four rounds of experiment. And in the fourth round, we want to sell 500 units. And legal was like, oh, you mean 500,000? At which point there was a very awkward pause in the conversation, right? Because <laughs> at legal, the major multinational corporation, like why am I wasting my time talking about breaking all these rules for 500 units, right? It's a rounding error for them. So I had to get them on board to explain. So now I do two things. When I show up at a company, one of the first things I do is I ask to sit with legal. I've made up a document here that says this is all kind of the variety of experiences, the garden variety, right? We're probably gonna do a Facebook ad campaign, fake sell something, right? Maybe a concierge. Explain the implications of everything. Uh, and the tools, a lot of tools are developed in the America uh, and the Europeans have greater security and privacy restrictions around their stuff. We can't capture email addresses or people's personal data without notifying them and American tools don't follow those rules. So, you know, we gotta look at it on the page, right? And at the end, we have a checklist on the front. It says, yes, no, with Janet's involvement, right? Because sometimes I'm considered adult supervision. Um, <laughs> so, and we do it and the teams love it because would you rather be operating in the gray area or would you rather say, here I know where my sandbox rules are? right, and know where the thing is. So, you know, bring them on. So that's one thing I do. I proactively work with the people because it's better to proactively bring them on than get caught later on. The second thing is I feel like I have to win over their hearts and minds. 
So we run a week-long innovation masterclass where we bring in its one-third innovators and two-thirds internal ecosystem, HR, procurement, finance, legal. And they come in and on Monday, they're like, all right, we give them to say, give me an idea you think this company should launch as a product. You're gonna, you're gonna launch a product. And they, so they sit there and they think of an idea like, oh, our company needs this. And then Monday we start doing our customer development. They go out and talk to customers. By Wednesday they're running an experiment. And by Friday they have a mini demo day where they present their idea. Right? And so one time I did this recently, it was, uh, I think it was Wednesday, and one guy who was in sales said, hey, can, can I ask a question? So I was like, okay. Uh, and he had come up on Monday, he had an idea he thought was awesome. And then he went out to his customers, or customers, and uh, talked to them and found out nobody cared. Like nobody liked his idea, they all thought it was stupid, right? And so he was pivoting. And he wanted to ask, he was like, hey, can I ask the group, like who else is here pivoting on their idea? And you looked around the room and everybody's hand, there's like 30 or 40 people, everybody's hand went up. And all of a sudden you can feel it settle in at a deeper level, right? Because I can tell you most first ideas are not good. I could probably give you data. I could give you an HBR article. But you know what people hear when I say this? What they hear is most ideas, first ideas are not good, but my idea, right? <laughs> and so you have to give them the experience of what we're doing. And then all of a sudden they're like, aha, I get it. And the next time an entrepreneur walks into their office and says, I'm trying to sell 500 units, <laughs> right? they're going to be like, all right, I get what you're doing. Let me see how I can help you. right? Um, so that is what I have for you today. Four minutes left. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me. There's my email address. But good luck, uh, and I hope you guys can get your container ships to have speedboats as well. Thank you. Thank you.